She comes with a mask that has no face, mingling and playing with our children, which we send on our roads, happy, unassuming, uttering the quintessential Halloween phrase, trick or treat. Every year we send our children out to play, for if we don't, she comes for us, to meet out judgement in a case in which we have not voices. Or so the stories go. The town I live in is a small, derelict place, built from the gold boom of early America. It's dying now. After the end of the gold came the industry, machines and roads that stretched and walked the earth around them, jutting waste and evil into the air. For the past 38 years, there have been 20 kids living in our town. Never more, never less. I suppose the girl with no face. She is behind this somewhat, trapping us in and keeping others out. This is a fact I know to be true. The year my youngest son was born, old man McGrath's young daughter was killed in a hit and run just outside town. Only 17. Or so the legend goes. We send them all out, every year. It has taken time to learn the role she plays, that strange, faceless girl. So, like clockwork, we send twenty children to play and dance, searching for Condi. And then she joins them, and there are twenty-one. Twenty children, and one, that was never meant to be. She's trapped us here somehow, in this derelict place we call home. But, in a way, Somehow. I guess she keeps us alive. The town, I mean. Somehow. A couple years ago, there was a man who moved into town. Izzy Crane was his name, and he hailed from one of those up-and-coming cities, along with his son, Darren. Now, we feared this sea. Izzy Crane was one of those guys who believed in straightforward progress, and he'd come here like an advance guard. Rumours of untapped oil, see? A man who had not our interests in mind, but a faceless corporation behind him. And we feared that with the arrival of his son, one of our children would be claimed by the curse. I remember that Halloween night very vividly. He was on my doorstep. My house was always well decorated, and I supposed he looked down on that. Now, he'd say, a sweet southern drawl thick in his throat. I don't really get why you'll keep this stuff up. He shook his head. I wondered if he'd just come to complain. I think it's all silly. Just a bunch of old superstitions from ye olden times, you know? I shook my head. Where's your boy? I asked. Darren. At home, he shrugged, muttering something about the future. I had warned him of this, of the curse that had befallen our town for as long as I could remember. I know you'll take this. He said the words mockingly next, hunched over, as if he were a scarecrow. Curse, seriously. I cut him off before he could continue. I think you should let him, just this once. The season only comes when you're young. I was about to tell him about the curse again when he looked away, suddenly stunned. He raised a hand to his brow and squinted. Darren, he shouted. His kid looked back, smiling with bits of candy corn in his mouth, waving. Darren, come back here. I quickly counted the kids on the small street. Everything was laid out on. The Milgrims, Nonnas, Funderburgers, two, four, eight. I continued to count. Twenty-two. I think you should really let him play, I urged. Not because of the curse. It's just part of childhood. Haven't you heard that? He called. The boy came running away from what I swore to be the girl in the mask, which had no face. But when I blinked, she was gone, a thousand empty wraps in place. Izzy Crane hunched back and stared into my eyes. I turned away from that a long time ago, miss. He struggled to remember my name somewhat. Well, dear me, I'd forgotten. Bark, I finished. But he was busy scolding Darren for leaving. Darren complained. But it's fun, he pleaded. Plus, the really nice girl knocked, and asked specifically for me to come. I really urge you to let him play, I told. I was serious now. Really? No, he denied. No need for this superstitious. 
he caught himself before swearing. No. And he walked away, in his strange fashion. He was dressed for business as always, and I wondered if we would really be safe. Dying as it was, I still found solace in its odd alleyways, legends, people. When I was younger, my mother tried to leave our town. Just for Halloween, we were somewhere across the country. Florida, I remember. With a cousin. I had played with him then, that cousin. And then, she was there too. The girl in the doll-like dress and that mask. That damned mask with no face. And she played with us all night. I don't remember feeling scared of her. Just in awe. But my mother, right next to us as we journeyed the streets, like adventurers. She was shaking to her core. At the end of it all, we returned to our house, and then she asked to speak to my mother. Me and my cousin left, inside, to count our treasures. But I kept an eye out. She knelt down, and the girl with no face whispered into her ear. She trembled, face shaking, terrified. And then the girl saw me through that no-face plastic, tilted her head, and waved goodbye. The next moment I remember is my mother rushing me to a car to the airport, and I vividly recall seeing candy wrappers in the wind, the shape of the girl who had no face. I considered something. Izzy, I called. Let me! But he was too ignorant, too far to be reached. Tell you something. I suppose I could have tried harder, but nothing really could have stopped him. Not then, not there. I stayed up that night. I couldn't sleep. And later, as I spoke to my friends, they could not either, kept awake by a force that governed the cosmos greater than our own. We were all drawn to the yard by it, her. She came in the dead of night as we watched, skipping with a bug, overflowing with candy. She knocked on the fine wooden door of Izzy Crane. And out came Darren, kept awake whilst his father slept, unknowing. I reached out to warn him, but she snapped back at me, a small finger up to her mask, a warning. And then the two of them skipped to our houses, and to our little boxes of candy that stood on our doorstep. The young and up Izzy Crane woke from his bed that minute, screaming and yelling for his boy. He looked back from where the street met the road, and he was gone in the wind, spirited away into a thousand pieces of flavourless white candy corn. Izzy Crane ran up to stop it, but it was too late. He stopped in front of the girl in the faceless mask. She beckoned for him to kneel. He did. She whispered into his ear, turned around, and walked away. Leave. That was the word we thought she'd whispered. If only that were true. Something in him broke that day. He lost it all, and yet in defiance of the order we'd suspected, he stayed, watching, waiting, studying for the next Halloween to come. Intelligent and all this time, he was sure he knew of a way to get him back. So that year, he was ready. I should know. I saw the inside of his house one day, top to bottom with newspapers from the olden days, details on a case of murder, previous disappearances, potential origins of the creature that stalked our town. Ms. Buck, he spoke to me loudly one day. He was dishevelled but awake, drunken and yet sober. I think I've got this all figured out. No, I warned. You haven't. And I really think you should leave. It all dates back to the 1920s, he exclaimed, bothering the two other customers at my bakery. I know how to get him back. It must be some evil family. Every child sent out to abduct others. Okay. What? Had he really gone off the rails? There is no curse. It's a plot. The lot of it. From those guys in the government who use our kids as blood. The secret cabal. I only had one word. What? He grinned maniacally, 
Don't you see? If you all strike against these kids, this family of traffickers, we can end this. He must be still alive, he... He paused and quieted. Must. Mr. Crane, I began. I think you should leave. He backed away, slowly. Not just here, but this town. I stood up now. But help yourself to a cherry pie before you go. He did. And for that, in an odd way, I was glad. I almost thought he'd actually leave. But, no. Now he was Bark. Two people with him. Two large and burly people, armed with crowbars. And it was Halloween night, and all our children were out to play. To wander and keep us safe. And then she appeared, watching us all in the midst of it. This year, she wore a vest and a cap, boyish, different somewhat, and she wasn't alone. Her parents were there, lurking in the shadows, if they really were. They too were masked, in the bushes, only seen by those who were truly looking, those who truly believed. They wore farmhand's garb, out of a book of pictures, and had faces made of straw, a thin plastic mask on their heads. Thin, squirming lines of hay poked out from cracks in the mask. I shuddered. Izzy Crane and his buddies confronted the girl in the centre of the street, pushing her off onto the ground. The other kids drew bark, terrified. They knew the danger and the younger ones were swept away by the older, more knowing ones. Listen here, you cabal freak! Izzy snapped. Give me back your son! He caught himself, confused. Your son? I stepped back, terrified. Why? Why can't I? He pushed to the ground as she rose. Someone told him to back off. That someone fell to the floor, swept by unseen forces. Take her, he ordered, and his two friends did so, one arm each, lifting her up. And then her parents, if it really was her parents, came from the brush, bits and pieces of straw swaying in the wind. They moved slowly and gracefully, quietly. The men stood still, not entirely sure what to make of them. And then the father of straw wrapped a hand of straw around the larger one's neck and... His head came off, without a sound. And instead of blood, were yellow bits of dry farm on straw. The other, smaller man, let go of the girl and lunged at the mother of straw. She fell and burst into needles, which punctured the man until he too was on the ground, leaking straw. And then Izzy Crane backed away, and then the girl behind him pushed him, and he fell to the ground. Please, he urged. My son, I'll do anything. I won't let them have your town, I'll... She whispered something again in his ears. And then her and her parents of straw skipped away, vanishing quietly. By morning, only Izzy was left, sobbing. His two men were nothing more than straw men. A leftover decoration. This past year, I think he finally learned his lesson. Because he was out there this time sort of gently at the curb of his house. He was more quiet this year around. No rants, no ideas. He was just there. I felt sorry in a way. He did not deserve our curse and joined him. What does she say? I asked. She'd never really spoken much, save for trick or treats, or simply kids speak. She told me to. His voice caught. I looked up to see her, walking with my kids, searching for treasures. Stay. We were wrong. Why? I think I get it now, he murmured, and then the girl in the mask was in front of us. Chick or treat, she laughed, kind and warm, in a strange, sweet way. Not to me, but to him. He reached into his pockets and gave her what he had. A dozen pieces of candy, the best that money could buy. And she smiled and spoke to him. Thank you for staying, 
It's been a while since I had a friend. And then she was gone, back into the mass of kids and parents. Hers were not there. Izzy Crane sighed and stood up, walking away. And then came a voice, one familiar, yet older in a way. Dad? He turned back. So did I. His kid, Darren, was there. Exactly as we'd all seen him before. Except he wore a mask as faceless as the girl who cursed our forefathers so long ago. They met midway in a hog. She has something for you, he told. It was a mask for his own. He put it on as they hugged. And then they weren't there. Gone into the wind. A thousand condi wrappers floating gently away. Spirited away. I heard a voice then. She'd come for me. Trick or treat! I gave her my dues. Two large bars. You can never be too careful. And she was gone. In fact, she never came back. Our town died soon after, and we all fled into the wind. Sometimes I wonder where she is. Sometimes I catch a glimpse of her during days when the moon shines just a little too bright. Some of the others think she's really gone though. Not me. So, if you ever see a little girl in a mask that has no face, do give her some candy. I think you'll find that she's just like us. Lonely, in a way, somehow. I think you both would really appreciate it.